the, the easy one right off the top. Mm. Why was Wilson on your list of four? Um, the easiest way to answer that is <clears throat> when I was 10 years old, uh, a youngster of annoying precocity. Um, I'm sure. A preview of coming <laughs> attractions. <laughs> Just playing a strange kid. Um, I read a book by an author named Gene Smith, and it was called When the Cheering Stops. And it was a wonderful book, a book about, ostensibly about Wilson's presidency, but as much about his post-presidential life, uh, and particularly the period following his stroke in 1919, the fight over the League of Nations. Um, and Gene Smith was not an academic, um, not a professional scholar. What he was was a wonderful storyteller. And, and Wilson, whatever you think of Wilson, Wilson's is a great story. Um, many would say a great tragedy. Um, Woodrow Wilson <coughs> is one of the most significant American presidents, period. Um, Woodrow Wilson's legislative record, particularly in his first years in office, is in many ways a preview of FDR's New Deal and LBJ's Great Society. Um, and in some ways it was even more impressive because he was the first president to exercise that kind of almost parliamentary control. He was as much a prime minister as he was a president. Um, Wilson's role in foreign policy, which is still hotly debated, but that in itself attests to its significance, um, is relevant in ways, well, I, like lots of you, I've been following, been watching these extraordinary pictures coming out of Tripoli and other, and Libyan cities this week. And these people who are risking death uh, for a taste of freedom. In many, many ways, they're responding to the Wilsonian summons. Um, Woodrow Wilson believed that America had, in effect, a missionary role to play. That America, he, he once said, people accuse me of being an idealist. That's how I know I'm an American. Um, he believed passionately in self-determination, in the rule of international law, in disarmament, uh, in democracy applied to the global stage. Um, and it is no exaggeration to say, with very rare exceptions, that every president since has been defined either as a Wilsonian or not a Wilsonian. Um, and there's any number of things we can talk about. But, um, but I think both the domestic record the war record, the fact that Wilson, through the sheer power of his eloquence, we forget what a, what a remarkable orator he was in an age when that still mattered. Um, he convinced a profoundly isolationist country that it was in our interests, as well as our ideals, to go to war in Europe. That was an extraordinary thing. Now, you can debate, as indeed people debated at the time, whether in fact that was uh, a wise course. There's no doubt that there was a backlash, uh, particularly after the war. Wilson, in effect, succeeded too much. He took people to the mountaintop. He, he, he painted with words this uh, almost utopian vision of, of what the world could be a world made safe for democracy, a war to end war. Um, and we were, in some ways, naive, and we believed it. And when it didn't happen, we tended to blame him. But that's part of the tragedy, and it's part of the ongoing significance of the Wilsonian strain in the American character. His path to the presidency, is his first election in 1912, was really uniquely different, totally different from what you would never, 
you would ever see today. I mean, it, it took dozens of ballots for him to win the nomination. Everything about and then Wilson's, he wound up with forty-two percent of the vote. Yeah, Talk every, a little bit about that. Everything about Wilson's political career uh, defies the odds. Um, you know, it's interesting. He had less political experience than any American president. Um, the, the most recent American president whose career in terms of office holding um, is, is, um, is comparable to Wilson's was George W. Bush. You know, a term and a half as governor of Texas. Wilson had less. Wilson had one term, two years as governor of New Jersey. Before that, of course, he had been president of Princeton University. He's the only PhD to be president, take that for what you will. Um, the only political scientist to be uh, a, an American president. He was an educator, uh, the scholar in politics. Um, a very unlikely figure in every sense of the word. But events came together at the beginning of the 20th century uh, to create this climate, what we now know as the progressive era. And Wilson, first of all, the another unique thing about Wilson was, of course, he was a son of the South. He was born in Virginia, raised in Georgia, the Carolinas. Um, he, he was, in many ways, a nomadic figure. He was a divided figure. He talked about, he said, I feel like I'm sitting on top of a volcano, emotionally. And by that he meant, he talked about the Irish in him and he talked about the Scottish in him. And the two were constantly at war. Uh, one was very generous and, and, and emotional and, and inclined to uh, wage uh, battle. Uh, the other was rather canny and tenacious and cold. And, and, and those qualities, in a sense, were at war with, with, with each other. Um, he was brilliant. He was, um, he was also, it's interesting, he was dyslexic. Didn't learn his alphabet until he was nine years old. And his vocabulary, you know how many, you know how large his vocabulary was? His father was a Presbyterian minister and he trained his son in the use of words. Words, all his life, words were to be Wilson's weapons. Words often took the place of relationships. Uh, Wilson had a vocabulary estimated at 61,000 words, which is pretty remarkable, and especially, I would say, for a dyslexic. Um, Wilson um, trained himself to write in shorthand. Um, he, he was a very disciplined figure, loved baseball, was a baseball fanatic. If you go to the Wilson House in Washington, the office off of the entrance is called the dugout. And in the dugout, um, there's a ball on the, uh, uh, over the, uh, the fireplace mantle. And it's an American baseball signed by King George V. Um, Wilson stayed at Buckingham Palace after uh, World War I. Um, so you have this really odd combination. Wilson's memories, where does the anti-war strain come from? Wilson's earliest memory was the age of three hearing news of Lincoln's election from his neighbors and, and the, and the uh, likelihood of war. Um, several years later, he never forgot once looking up into the face of Robert E. Lee. And even more powerful was the impression of watching ex-Confederate President Jefferson Davis led in chains through, through his, his town. Um, I think Wilson was stamped early on with the futility of war. Um, although he was of the South, he was not, uh, for example, he was not a great advocate historically or politically of, of the Southern cause, and yet he is quite understandably uh, pilloried today for his racial views. Now here's the paradox. This is a man who, as President of the United States, um, shine his own shoes to avoid, so that the servants wouldn't have to do it. 
and yet he reinstated segregation in the federal workforce. He convinced himself that it wasn't racism, but that it was a bizarre form of sensitivity, that he, he by keeping the races apart, they wouldn't, they wouldn't clash. And the irony is in 1912, when he ran this four-way race against Teddy Roosevelt, William Howard Taft, and Gene Debs, the socialist candidate, um, he actually was the first Democrat in modern times to get a significant part of the black vote. Um, and need to say, African Americans were bitterly disappointed once he took office. And, and it's, 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 it's one of the great mysteries of Wilson. This man who has become synonymous with self-determination, um, individual and national, around the world, uh, and nevertheless couldn't see his way to that uh, in his own country. Mrs. Wilson, famously, on her deathbed, Ellen Wilson, the first Mrs. Wilson, uh, was appalled by the slums of Washington, D.C. And she got Congress to pass legislation to basically clear those slums. Um, and it was passed while she literally was dying. Um, the second floor of the East Room, or of the, of the White House, overlooking the Rose Garden, which she had <laughs> designed. Um, the famous Rose Garden that's there today. Um, so, you know, Wilson, Wilson is one of these figures who, just when you think you've got a fix on him, I guarantee you, he'll do or say something that will surprise you. Where does the Federal Reserve Act that was passed in 1913, where does that fit into his, uh, into his overall legacy? Yeah, Wilson, remember, Wilson runs in 1912. Teddy Roosevelt runs on what he calls the new nationalism. TR has, has veered significantly to the left. And he wants a government big enough to regulate the trusts. He's moved beyond trust busting. He wants a government, and anyway. Wilson, on the other hand, it's, it, it strikes me as curious that there are conservatives who, um, are, who think of Wilson as an arch enemy. Because what Wilson was trying to do was actually to restore competition. People like Louis Brandeis, whom he put on the Supreme Court, the first Jewish member of the court. Uh, Louis Brandeis was a great champion of restoring competition. It's almost a Jeffersonian ideal translated to the modern industrial age. And so, for example, what does Wilson do? In his first term, he creates the Federal Trade Commission. He creates a new, the Clayton Antitrust Act, uh, which is, the, uh, uh, like the Sherman Antitrust Act, only with teeth. Uh, and he creates the Federal Reserve um, to become the nation's banker, um, which is a curiously Hamiltonian idea. Um, so, you know, the, the, the idea that the United States, um, by the beginning of the 20th century, was the world's foremost economic power, agricultural power, industrial power, uh, certainly not military power, that was about to change, or diplomatic influence. But economically, there's no doubt that this country had outstripped the institutions of government. And um, uh, we had reached a point where a lot of people believed, and it was bipartisan, Nelson Aldrich, Republican Senate leader, um, and the man for whom Nelson Aldrich Rockefeller would be, uh, would be named. Uh, Nelson Aldridge, Republican from Rhode Island, wrote the first draft of the Federal Reserve. Uh, Wilson took that draft, compromised with liberals in his own party, and created a central bank. Now, you know, people have criticized, and people criticize the Federal Reserve to this day. I don't think it's fair to blame Woodrow Wilson, you know, for Ben Bernanke. Um, but in any event, I, I am ask you to imagine American economic history over the last 100 years if you took the Federal Reserve out of the picture. What were some of Wilson's other domestic accomplishments that you would point to? Well, it's interesting. Child labor. 